there's a diet that seems to be changing people's lives for the better. I've lost all this weight and I feel better and my heart feels better and my blood sugar's normal. If you followed this diet, we could reverse obesity and type 2 diabetes. Even elite athletes are rethinking the way they eat. Now, um, now it's just so much easier to control the weight. LeBron James and Carmelo Anthony and Kobe Bryant, you know, three of the, the biggest stars in, in American basketball, are now on low-carb eating. But is this just another fad? What sells books is a new solution to our weight loss problems, and carbohydrates are the perennial villain in this case. And a lot of these low-carbohydrate diets that people are following are fad diets and people aren't meeting all of their nutrition requirements, so that can actually be quite dangerous. In this special edition of Catalyst, I investigate the science behind the low-carb diet. Should everyone be on it? And what are the risks? In the 70s, dietary guidelines around the world promoted the food pyramid, which recommended we reduce fat and eat a lot more carbohydrate. It was recognised that carbohydrates were a cheap energy source, and still are. And as cheap energy source, they've made it into our diet. Get off the fat seat. Get it off. Reducing fat became the cornerstone of health advice for the next 40 years. Fat doesn't just build up around your waist. As a nutritionist, I'm willing to wear some of the blame here that just that the simple eat less fat message hasn't worked very well. What happened was people ate less fat and replaced it with a lot of processed carbohydrates, particularly sugar. We're all having far too many carbs in our soft drinks, in our fruit juices. Processed food is full of carbohydrates because when they took the fat out of food, they took all the flavour out, so they had to replace it with something. What they deny is that humans have no essential requirement for carbohydrate. Controversially, some doctors are now proposing we flip the message. Instead of reducing fat, we need to reduce carbs. We're just collecting the information, we're collecting the people. South African professor Tim Noakes believes the surge in carbohydrate consumption has contributed to the obesity epidemic. Why? Because carbohydrates stimulate a hormone called insulin, which increases the body's fat stores. The role of insulin in the body is to build fat. So if you're consistently eating every three hours carbohydrates, what happens is you consistently have an elevated insulin concentration in your blood. What that does is it drives the excess carbohydrate into the fat cells and the fat cells now cannot release the fat. The brain in some way interprets this as that you're starving, so three hours later you have to go and eat again. And that is why you get this repetitive eating behavior in people who are eating carbohydrates. Of the three dietary macronutrients, carbohydrates are the most potent stimulator of insulin. When you eat fat, you get essentially no insulin response. When you eat protein, you get a moderate response. When you eat carbohydrates, you get relatively high responses. Many people get the wrong impression of this diet. It is not a high protein diet for that very reason. We don't want all that insulin secretion from a high protein intake. However, you do need enough protein to sustain your muscle mass and also to prevent hunger. But predominantly, it's a low-carbohydrate diet. That is the key. Professor Noakes says the low-carb diet with moderate amounts of protein helps you lose weight because it reduces cravings and makes you feel fuller for longer. What this diet does is it is high in fat and protein and that satiates your brain and reduces your hunger. And that is the key to this whole process because if you can reduce your hunger, your calorie consumption goes down. Thanks for coming in today. Um, so, have you seen a dietitian before? No, I haven't. Oh, okay. So, Spokesperson for the Dietitians Association of Australia, Melanie McGrice, agrees that a low carb diet can help with weight loss. Somebody who I would consider putting onto a lower carbohydrate, higher fat diet might be somebody who needs to lose weight quickly, possibly if they're going to have surgery, or they might have been able to do exercise in the past, but now they've put on too much weight and they just need to get some fast weight loss off so that they can go and get back into exercise again. So there's certainly times and places for a lower carbohydrate, higher fat diet. But what we need to remember is that 
That's not a solution for everyone. While dietary carbohydrates are normally the main source of fuel in the body, they're not an essential macronutrient. If you remove them from the diet, the body can switch to burning fat for energy instead. Humans have absolutely no requirement for carbohydrate. Not one gram do we require. Whereas there are essential fats and essential proteins which we cannot generate in our body. We have this fabulous liver that produces as much glucose as you require. The optimal level of dietary carbohydrates will depend on how well your body processes them. Some people metabolize them better than others. Low-carb advocate Dr. Steve Finney says many people are actually unaware that they're carbohydrate intolerant. Carbohydrate intolerance is associated with some physical findings, such as fat carried around the metal. It's associated in people generally if they have a strong family history of type 2 diabetes. You have what we call pre-diabetes or metabolic syndrome. We have people generally who are severely overweight. And then there are some other conditions such as polycystic ovary syndrome in women uh, that is, they may not be overweight, they may not have diabetes, but is very responsive to carbohydrate restriction. Professor Tim Crow, a nutritionist from Deakin University, is concerned that this diet will eliminate healthy food groups. A very extreme low carb diet can be quite restrictive. So it cuts out a lot of foods, particularly a lot of you know, whole grain foods and even fruit that has to be cut out as well. These are really good healthy foods that we know reduce the long term risk of chronic disease. For many people, whole grains are an excellent source of energy and a healthful food. But when people become more insulin resistant, they have a difficult time disposing of those carbohydrates. We're not saying get rid of whole grains in the diet, we're just saying reducing them in the most vulnerable fraction of the population that can't tolerate them. But what about athletes? It's always been assumed that carbs are an essential fuel source for exercise. Professor Noakes has spent years as an exercise and sports scientist, preaching the benefits of carb loading before a big race, and even published it in a widely popular book called The Law of Running. I spent 33 years of my life telling athletes that they must carbohydrate load, which meant that for the last three days before a marathon, you should eat 700 or 800 grams of carbohydrate. And I was the first in the world to produce these goos that people live their races on. So if you go to the Ironman, you'll see people taking goos every half hour or so. So myself and Bruce Fordyce, who's the great South African ultramarathon runner, developed that product. And I apologize because that was completely wrong. He says in explosive events, when you need a fast fuel source, then carbs will help. But for endurance athletes, you can last just as long by burning fat for fuel. Once the event lasts two or three hours, I don't see any advantage to carbohydrates. And then increasingly you burn fat. And the more fat you eat in your diet, the more adapted you are. You can burn an enormous amount of fat if you're an elite athlete and easily cover really good performance running very fast. But you have to become fat adapted. A pioneering study on the performance of cyclists who were fat adapted was done by Dr. Finney. My initial study on athletes done 30 years ago involved five bike racers who we controlled in a metabolic ward, fed them their usual diet for a week and tested their peak aerobic capacity and their endurance time to exhaustion. The cyclists were then fed a very low carb, high fat diet for four weeks and their performance was retested. And what that study demonstrated was if you give people at least four weeks to adapt, they come all the way back to their previous levels of performance and are able to do that in the absence of carbohydrates. And the reason they can do that appears to be because ketones replace much of the body's requirement for glucose. Ketones become the alternative fuel source. They're produced when fat is being burnt for energy and can be measured in the blood or urine. In this state, the person is said to be in ketosis. But are there risks? 
Ketosis, we know that people that follow these diets are short-term experiencing fatigue, lethargy, constipation. But ketosis, long-term, we don't know if it causes any serious problems, such as renal problems and so on. So at the moment, it seems to be fairly safe. Dr Finney has no doubt that burning fat for energy instead of carbs gives endurance athletes the winning edge. For athletes attempting to do prolonged endurance performance, if their body can be trained to use that fat as their predominant fuel, that fuel tank is more than 10 times as big as the carbohydrate tank. And that's why we see the ultra endurance athletes now, not just winning races, but setting records on low carbohydrate diets. Endurance wise, it actually makes sense to be using fat as for your fuel tank, which is good for many hours, but when you need that high power output, to sprint to the finish line or to, to ride up the hill. As an athlete, you actually fall behind because that's when your body needs carbohydrates for maximum energy output and you don't get that. Low carbohydrate diets are naturally higher in fat. We've been so conditioned to fear fat that making it a large component of your diet is hard to wrap your head around. It certainly was for Australian cricketer Shane Watson. Everyone that had educated me about the way to eat and eat a low-fat diet meant that I had a fat phobia. I cut all my fat off, all my chicken, my meat, my bacon, everything. So I stayed away from butter, from cheese, I stayed away from nuts, like only a little bit of avocado, all the foods that are high in fat and high in energy. But in the end, I was always very hungry because I was cutting all the fat out of my diet and was just loading up on carbs. Within an hour of eating, I was always very hungry. It took the personal experience of Australian cricket team doctor Peter Bruckner to open Shane's eyes to a new way of eating. I had just turned 60, which was the age my father had developed type 2 diabetes. I was overweight, so I tested all my bloods before I went on this diet and then went on the diet for 12 weeks, lost 12 kilograms, easy as you like, eating low carb, high fat, so the old the way our parents used to eat, you know, eggs and bacon and butter and cream and milk and all those things that had been forbidden for 30 years and stopped eating all the, uh, the sugary things and, uh, and pasta and rice and bread, all the things that I'd been, been eating. And the weight just fell off and I was enjoying my food. I felt fantastic. My exercise capacity increased and uh, I got to the end of that and I, I just couldn't believe it. Soon after that, I went on tour. I'd already started my job with the cricket team, and the guys are all be coming up, Doc, you know, hey, what's happened, you know? And some of them, in particular, Shane Watson and Mitchell Johnson, got very interested in the whole idea and, uh, and decided they wanted to have a crack. For the next 18 months, Shane went on the low carb diet, while Dr. Bruckner monitored him closely. So your blood pressure is 133 over 66, which is excellent. Peter, how has Shane's medical records changed since being on the diet? Well, Shane's always been one of these players who, despite high levels of exercise as an elite athlete, has always had a weight problem. And he's previously, the only way he could do it was really to starve himself. But since he's gone onto this diet, he's able to eat well, eat a large amount of saturated fat. His weight has been good. His skin folds, which is the way we measure the body fat, we measure that regularly in all the players. His skin folds have come down, so his body fat has come down, yet he's maintained his muscle mass. So uh, he's also enjoying his food a lot more. He's much uh, less grumpy than he used to be when he's dieting. And generally, I think it's been a really positive thing as far as his... Uh, his, his well-being goes. Well, my energy levels throughout the day have certainly improved. There's no doubt leading into a break like lunch or tea, I'm certainly not as hungry as what I was, so energy's spread out really nicely throughout the whole day. When I first heard about restricting carbohydrates, Atkins diet came to mind. How is this different to Atkins? Look, it's fairly similar. Um, Atkins was low carbohydrate. Atkins probably didn't emphasise the fat as much. So they probably had a higher protein and not as much fat. And I think the fat is really important. It's sort of hard to get your head around the fact that, you know, the more fat you eat, the more fat you lose. You know, that, that's a very difficult uh, paradigm. So there are a lot of people out there who, who struggle with that. The only way in which this is slightly different from Atkins is we promote vegetables. Atkins wasn't really keen on vegetables, but his principles were the same. It was to cut carbohydrates. When we hear about fat, it conjures up images of deep fried chips and highly processed foods full of unhealthy trans fats. Well, this is different. It's real food full of natural fats like coconut, cheese, eggs and fatty meats, even good old fashioned butter. 
the best thing about this way of life is you don't have to calorie count. But Celebrity chef and vocal campaigner of low-carb diets, Pete Evans, says cooking with fat gets the best results. We yep. know this. Chefs yep. know it. Fat yep. equals flavour. Mm -hmm. How good is that? We've got animal fat. And here we've got duck fat, but you could use beef tallow, yeah. which is the fat from a cow. You could yeah. use lard, which is fat from a pig. You could use butter from the cow. All the, the things cow. we've been told not to eat. Exactly. <laughs> and my favourite, coconut oil, which yeah. is absolutely fantastic. Great monounsaturated fat. Yeah. And you can eat it by a spoonful. I see, like, bone marrow and liver. These are rather old-fashioned cuts of meat. We tend to go for the lean steaks nowadays. Yeah, exactly. And what's interesting is our great-grandparents, they would have been eating marrow, heart, liver, brains, all of that, because nothing ever used to go to waste. Because, number one, it's cheap. Yeah. Number two, it's absolutely delicious. And number three, it's the most nutritious part of the animal that we can work with. When restricting dietary carbs, people end up eating more fat, often saturated fat, which has been implicated in the development of heart disease. The first question that I asked him was, what about my arteries? Aren't I just going to, like, isn't that fat that I'm eating just going to go straight up and clog my arteries? And he made it very clear that that certainly wasn't the case. One of the concerns is that the diet is high in saturated fat, which we're told raises cholesterol and causes heart disease. Are you concerned about Shane's cholesterol? Not particularly. In Shane's case, the HDL cholesterol, the so-called good cholesterol, has gone up. The triglycerides, which I think are probably the most important component, they're, they're carbohydrate-driven, and they have not surprisingly gone down significantly. So I think he's in a much better situation now than he was prior to this diet. One of the great myths of the heart disease theory is that you eat saturated fat and it somehow miraculously goes from your gut and plugs your coronary arteries. Saturated fat is not bad for you. We know that now. There is ample evidence that saturated fat is not the bogey it used to be. It's a great source of energy. In the last decade, the medical literature has cast doubt over the link between saturated fat and heart disease. Recently, this widely circulated article in Time magazine questioned the controversial science of saturated fat and those organisations that say it's unhealthy. We approached the National Heart Foundation for an interview, but they declined to comment on camera. Instead, they issued a statement saying that they still recommend we reduce our saturated fat intake and replace it with unsaturated fats, found in foods like nuts, oily fish and vegetable oils. The Heart Foundation's TIC program recently came under fire for endorsing foods that are low in saturated fat, but high in sugar, like honey Cheerios. Now, 25 years on, the Foundation recently announced they're reviewing their TIC program. This comes shortly after the Canadian Heart and Stroke Foundation said they were scrapping their TIC program, their CEO admitting that public criticism played a role. Some nutritionists say these diets are too difficult to follow. All diets fail because they are prescriptive and they go against our normal eating habits. And the more restrictive they are, the harder they are to follow. It's really hard to give up bread and pasta and rice, things we really love, and that's what you have to say goodbye to in a low-carb diet. So most people, eventually, they will start reverting back to their old lifestyles and they'll be back to square one, ready to uh, soak up the next fad diet that comes along. Pete earns a living by sharing his passion for low-carb recipes. What we've got here is a basic spaghetti bolognese. Without the pasta, we use zucchini instead. And the bolognese itself is full of nose to tail, basically. So we've got some marrow in there, we've got some liver, we've got a little bit of heart, and of course, some beef mince from grass-fed cattle. And it tastes so good because it's so nutrient dense. Because, you know, Pete, we're always fighting this argument that food like this, because it doesn't contain grains, must be nutrient deficient because it has liver in it. It would be far more nutrient dense than anything that was grain-based. Now, we know that there's no one-size-fits-all approach when it comes to diet. However, there is scientific evidence to suggest that a large proportion of the population with obesity or diabetes would benefit from restricting carbohydrates. These people don't metabolise carbohydrates well. That's what diabetes is. It's a failure to metabolise carbohydrates. And yet we've traditionally given these people high-carbohydrate diets. I mean, it just does not make 
any sense at all. I think both in the treatment but also in the prevention of type 2 diabetes. If we reduce the amount of carbohydrates in our diet, we will have a massive impact on type 2 diabetes, which is in epidemic forms. If somebody has lactose intolerance, they don't tolerate milk sugar, we tell them not to drink fresh milk. So if people don't tolerate carbohydrates, why shouldn't we tell them to reduce their carbohydrate intake to the level where it no longer causes them problems? This diet is really not necessarily for everyone because there are many people who can handle the carbohydrates. It's only the people with insulin resistance and diabetes for whom it's an immediate problem and for whom they get immediate benefits. When I was told by the doctor that my blood sugar levels were really, really high at 14.7 fasting, that I would need a specialist for my liver. It was that moment that I felt my life was out of control. Gabrielle sought the help of Melbourne GP, Dr Zeeshan Arain, to manage her type 2 diabetes. When Gabrielle first came in, she was very keen not to have medication mm. and to try and reverse this or, or manage it as best she could with lifestyle measures. So I offered her the opportunity to go on a, a well-formulated, low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet. What exactly did you instruct Gabrielle to eat? I basically was quite prescriptive in what I told her. I said, I want you to eat plenty of natural fats, so cook in butter, coconut oil, use olive oil, don't go for the lean meat, go for the fatty cuts, a lot of egg, dairy if you can tolerate it, but more so the high fat dairy, so double cream, butter. All those uh, things we're told not to eat. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Under strict supervision, Gabrielle dramatically changed her diet. She stopped eating carbs from processed foods and began upping her fat intake. For the first 12 weeks, it was a very, very simple way of eating with vegetables. There was no fruit whatsoever because my sugar levels were really, really high, of course. And a meat, there was meat in there as well. It's wonderful not being hungry. No cravings? No hunger. There's no hunger. Over the last four or five months, when we retested her results, we found her to have not only a 10 kilogram weight loss, but the most impressive indicator to me was her HbA1c, which is that long-term measurement, had gone down to 5.4, which is what the normal population would have that's not diabetic. Her size of the liver, which was enlarged, 23 centimetres, has gone down to 15, which is normal. My goodness, you must have been pleased with those results. Yeah. <laughs> oh, fantastic. I don't believe that everybody with diabetes should automatically be going on to a low-carbohydrate diet. People who have medical conditions such as diabetes really should be going and seeing their accredited practicing dietitian for that personally tailored advice because people don't just come with diabetes, they come with a whole range of different um, other medical conditions. They come from different backgrounds, they have different lifestyles. Although treatment for diabetes should be tailored for the individual, endocrinologist Professor Catherine Samaras believes restricting carbohydrates and lowering calories is key for diabetics. In my view, it seems counterintuitive to be asking people who have a deficiency in insulin, an inability to produce enough insulin, a requirement for medications to help them make insulin, to be eating so much carbohydrate. A meal that's relatively high in carbohydrate can often produce very high glucose levels, and this is a problem. Professor Samaras has been working with the federal government to lower the carbohydrate level of hospital food. So this is what the average patient with diabetes in hospital today would have had for breakfast. Cereal, one slice of bread, with a little bit of jam for that, some fruit and a little bit of milk to put on their cereal. But what that amounts to when you actually calculate out the carbohydrate content is equivalent to 14 teaspoons of sugar. So what changes do you want to see implemented in this kind of diet? An alternative is to give people two slices of bread and an egg. And it only has half the amount of total carbohydrate, so seven teaspoon equivalents of carbohydrate versus 14. We know that if you have high glucose levels in hospital, you have worse outcomes and higher mortality and longer length of stay. Now, all of these cost the community, they cost families, they cost the Department of Health. We can simply improve that by just improving glucose control in hospital. And it seems obvious to all of us that changing diet is a fundamental path 
of improving the outcomes of people with diabetes. What's wrong with replacing these carbohydrates with low GI carbohydrates? Low GI carbohydrates just refer to how quickly the glucose is released into the bloodstream. But the load, the total amount of carbohydrates still has to be dealt with. In diabetes research, we're understanding more and more that you can wear out the pancreas by getting it to work extra hard. And so in that regard, the load of the carbohydrate actually counts. The GI may actually just blunt the glucose excursion after people eat, but it's still asking the pancreas to work extra hard. And so lowering the GI doesn't necessarily make the best outcomes. At this conference in Melbourne, health professionals gather to discuss the science behind a low-carb diet. There are around about 27, 28 randomised controlled trials and the low-carb, high-fat outperforms the low-fat way of eating. We know that we're not doing very well with our current dietary recommendations for diabetics. If you wanted to design a regime, a diet, that produced the worst outcomes in type 1 diabetes, you'd have the current recommendations. There's new paradigms around. You find that there's resistance, there's head in the sand. I mean, after all, People like me were telling them that what they'd been preaching for 30, 40 years was wrong. A critical review of the literature suggested that low-carb diets should be the first treatment option in diabetes because of the consistently good control of blood glucose and the reduction or elimination of diabetes medication. Diabetes Australia is an organisation that supports people with diabetes but some question their dietary advice to patients. They recommend low-fat meals based on high-fibre carbohydrate foods like breads and cereals, the very foods that raise blood sugar levels. Diabetes Australia declined to comment on camera, but issued a statement saying the public discussion about diabetes should not be about diets. There is no general diet, and that we should aim to have individualised, tailored advice for people with diabetes. The diet recommendations for people with diabetes are really quite old hat, and they haven't been revised or thought through well enough, given that we also have an epidemic of obesity that we're having to, we're having to deal with. In the United States, the recent recommendations for people with diabetes actually promote a lower carbohydrate intake. And I think we should be looking at that and adopting some of those philosophies and asking our patients to restrict their carbohydrate. So what would you say to people who think this is just a fad diet? I'd just say try it and see how much a difference it makes to your life. To me, fad means non-scientific and there is plenty of science out there. Ultimately, I have faith that my profession is a science and they will see the science and eventually come around to this, uh, this way of thinking. I think it doesn't matter which side of the fence you're sitting on, whether you're going to be following a low carbohydrate diet or a higher carbohydrate diet. One of the key messages that everybody agrees with is the fact that we should be following a diet that has non-processed foods and, and lots of whole foods. Next time on Catalyst, why do some people respond to exercise better than others? Meet Florence and Elizabeth, the 120 metre tunnel borers, and good news for fish on the Great Barrier Reef, why coral trout are seeing a boost in numbers. And go to our website for extended information about this episode and comments from the National Heart Foundation and Diabetes Australia. <laughs>